Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by CoolStuffInc.com, Alter Sleeves, as well as Twitch subscribers and Patreon supporters just like yourself. I am Evan Irwin. We get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, MDG Nerd Girl. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Ruben Bressler. Good evening. How's it going? Oh, it's it's a time, y'all. Uh, if you missed our pre-show, subscribers to the channel get access to our NSFW version early as well as our $5 plus patrons. And we kick it off with our first pick in our giveaway. Get your chance of 50 bucks worth of anything at CoolStuffInc.com. I type an exclamation mark raffle in the chat, but sub first to get two chances to win. We noted them dangling primes. And support your favorite streamer with your suggestions at the end of the show to see who we raid tonight. And of course, thanks to our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every single day. Somehow, <clears throat> somehow, ladies and gentlemen, somehow, a full 60 rares were spoiled from the upcoming set that has yet to begin its actual spoiler season. Somehow, all of these cards are out in the world, and mm -hmm. it is not even close to the biggest story this week. Like, it's yep. not even close. Like, it's not even... We're, we're, we're in footnote territory of like, hey, you know those 60 rares, like, spoiled and whatever, but... Uh, dumpster fire? I... You know, we we start today by talking about the open game license and the the leaked, the leaked slash rumored slash, you know, never officially said that this was officially anything, but a leaked draft of what some would say would be the upcoming open game license updates for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we touched about this because this just like it just happened when we filmed last week. And so it was like, wow, this seems bad. It reads bad. I'm really concerned about where this is going and it has exploded and it has gotten really, really gross. And <clears throat> so uh, I, I want to try to do a little bit of a, a retrospective here and a little bit of uh, trying to uh, ex explain sort of what went wrong. Ultimately, um, One of the first things that I think, you know, looking back hindsight, 2020, et cetera, is you got to ask yourself, how do you cook a frog? Very slowly. Am I right or am I right? Mm -hmm. So if you, I have no idea if you're right. I'm, I'm right. The point is, <laughs> the way you cook a You've frog. Never cooked a frog? Weird. I know, right? Uh, Tennessee, y'all. Uh, but, you know, you cook a frog slowly. You turn the heat up just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then before you know it, they're in boiling water and it's over. Right. Well, if you throw them right into the, the hissing frying pan, they're going to jump right back out of it. And so imagine that there was an update. And all it said was, you know, if you make over a million bucks worth of D&D stuff, we'll take 1% royalty. Why well, are you cooking them alive? It, it's not important. The point is that you make the changes slow <laughs> and gradual. You don't right. just from the top rope smash down with 20 to 25% royalties and we have access and license to all of your stuff and we have 100% control over everything you make and you have to report to us all of your financials over a certain amount and blah, 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 blah. And it just goes crazy. And so... You know, there's one thing of that they they try to do way too much, way too fast. And the other bit, and this is this is where I think they have a disconnect. You know, they're, if we're talking like up in the upper echelons of the executive suites, and you heard them say this when they talked about it in the fireside chat, which was, look, the mo most of these things, most of the ways that we're making this money, it's only going to affect a very small amount of people. You know what I mean? Like seven to 20 or whatever number they threw out. Just a, just a handful, you know, of companies and, and outlets around the world that are really going to be paying any kind of royalty or whatever. Well, here's the thing. They don't under, they didn't, they certainly underestimated the psychology of, you could almost argue your, your average person, certainly your average person in America. I can't speak for other countries, but let me tell you, if you grew up in the time area or the time period that I did, you were promised to be a rock star when you grew up. You were going to be the king of the world. You were going to own everything. That's the American dream. Yeah, and be the executive and have the house and do the whatevers and such and such. And what happens when, when you're told that, and that's kind of ingrained in the culture, and even when, when it doesn't happen, what you say is, well, if I do get, if I do make a D&D show and I get to be critical role one day, this is going to screw me over. Mm -hmm. And if I start doing a thing and I have a Kickstarter that blows up, this is going to mess with me. This is going to hurt me. And so suddenly you have all these people who absolutely will never in a million years be paying these royalties. They have well, it in their head. They're like, well, if I get successful, I might be paying royalties all of a sudden. So I got to care because the big dogs care. We're right back at where we talked about before, nerd girl, with the Twitch situation. Is you're going after the big dogs because if the big dogs can handle it, the little dogs will fall in line over time. 
Yeah, there. I agree with the things you said. However, it's 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 not just going to affect the big fish. Oh, it's going to affect the everyone open- in many different ways. But you know what I'm saying? Like that's what they harped on. They said, "Look, we're not. Okay. They're not paying. No, we're not. We're getting no money from all of these other little people. We're not affecting your Patreon." Blah blah. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. No, you're good. I um the the original open gaming license for Dungeons and Dragons allowed anyone mm-hmm. to make third party content using the rule set of D and D, and to my mind is directly responsible, perhaps in a delayed way. For the success of 5th edition, for the success of shows like Critical Role and channels like Dimension 20 Mm -hmm. to take off because the clout and gravitas that comes with the name Dungeons and Dragons carries huge weight. Even in the TTRPG space, people don't really know what a tabletop role playing game is. They know what a Dungeons and Dragons is. Right. Um, Oh, you play, you know, Starfinder. Is that a Dungeons and Dragons? They don't say... You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's one of those kind of things. Exactly. Um, and Kleenex the, situation. Oh, yeah, it's a clean. Exactly. It's a band aid. It's a Kleenex. It's what it's, it's synonymous with the brand. Exactly. So the OGL allowed every content creator, every mom and pop shop like me and, you know, and uh, D gens and dragons and every other show that makes a D and D show to make a stream, to make a campaign book to use the the rule set to build out their own world. And this new OGL not only will uh, change that going forward, but it attempts to change that retroactively, which is a huge legal thing, which I don't know if is possible. The, the lawyers will have to argue this one. Um, one of the statements that I read from the folks at Paizo, which we're, it, we're like, I'm jumping all over the map, we're getting there. but the folks who are at Paizo now they're the folks that make Pathfinder wrote the OGL back in the early 2000s. At least some of them did. Mm. And the people who wrote the OGL back in the early 2000s don't think that this new open gaming license 1.1 could possibly be legally binding based on how they wrote the original OGL. So like there's a whole legal ramification situation going on there too. Not to mention the fact that a whole mess of folks that you might not even think of have used the the open gaming license like Lucas Arts for gosh sakes um, when they made their uh, their their um, knights system. So, so there's a bunch of legal stuff to to hammer out, and I am so, already so tired. It's okay. Well, look, wizards they effed around, right? And they they effed around hard. So as the finding out continues. Uh, Paizo released a statement that currently appears to be so big it crashed their website uh, as it's not working right now. Uh, but what they did was they gave uh, Paizo, they said, here, here's this ball. Uh, there's the goal right over there. Would you like to dunk? And they said, oh, we would love to dunk. And then they just went Whoa! and just dunked all over them and basically said, hey, we're going to make an open RPG creative license, essentially an open source RPG system, much like Linux. That's going to be controlled by a nonprofit. We have a whole bunch of very big publishing names involved already, let alone the one that are going to continue to come on board once this happens. And you know, basically get rid of any ties whatsoever to the current D&D open game license. And honestly, this is like worst case scenario in many ways, because what Wizards did was even if they never do anything, even if they don't even acknowledge this ever, you know what I mean? Like if it never happens, they never bring it out, they never talk about it again. You put a gun to a lot of people's heads and that was scary. And regardless of the weather, the fact that they pull it back or they don't do it or they they, you know, they trim it down or whatever happens, you scared the hell out of a lot of people and a lot of people's livelihoods. 
and that's going to cause a huge backlash. And this is something that, and we were talking about in the, in the pre-show, this isn't going to happen overnight. This isn't going to affect things tomorrow or six months from now, but in 2025, in 2026, when all of this open source stuff gets sorted out and all these companies are officially detaching themselves because they know and they'll have that memory of the last week or so of, oh, my God, you remember when they almost like sank our entire like setup, sank our entire company or did incredible amounts of damage that we can't even fully detail what would happen like Oh my God, this is literally like, it's not just we decided not to do it. It is because we threatened to do it. It's going to cause a huge backlash. Um, so that's where we're at, where Paizo gets to end their little message. Well, we'll be there at your side. You can count on us to not go back on our word forever, period. We gave him the ball. Goals right over there. It's, it's, I, I, I don't know what wizards does from this point because i think it's clear from how this has played out that the c-suite of hasbro wizards of the coast is what came is where this came from Mm -hmm. this is not a cultural shift within wizards to want this the people who work in wizards are still the same people that we know who work in wizards like the people that you know go up and get called up to the big league and get to go design magic cards and make dungeons and dragons going into the future and you know it's it's us it's the same people like and it's obvious i think that this leak was someone this, the call came from inside the house yeah. this was very obviously someone this was very obviously someone saying i can't let this slide i'm gonna get fired but i can't let this slide well, and there yeah. was also the reddit post after the fact uh, with like sort of an update of someone who was saying that they work for wizards and some of the bigger sources have contacted that person the poster and verified and they're putting their names and weight behind it saying it is a wizard's employee and right. they're saying that um you know this is after the original leak saying that wizards only cares about subscriptions and they're trying to see how that goes and see if they take huge hits now uh before deciding whether or not to move forward um but real quick i just want to mention something i've been, been trying to get a word in here evan <laughs> about <laughs> Evan you feel it. very strongly. We're good. You mentioned that this is similar to the Twitch thing, where Twitch uh, took away some of the sub revenue from larger creators, going mm-hmm. after the big dogs, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I want to say it's a little bit different, and the reason why I think the Twitch community took that pill a lot better than the Wizards community is, is because this isn't something that they're they're taking away something from everybody, even mm-hmm. the people who aren't big enough yet that are losing money, they're taking away the possibility of growth. Yeah. Whereas here for Wizard or for Twitch, I'm sorry, they're not, they're taking away something that was gifted to the larger content creators. They were giving a better rate versus um, the the standard rate. Mm-hmm. So currently the standard is no rake. Now they're taking that away from everybody versus giving big people, giving the rich more, more riches. Right. So the community as a whole was a lot more okay with that than it is here because it's hurting the entire community. Um, you know, companies backing out and creating less products for the game that people love is detrimental to the whole community. It doesn't matter who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, the biggest big streamers making $1 less per sub is not necessarily hurting the Twitch community as a whole. Right. And it is important to note that uh, while the royalties are only going to be asked for revenues in excess of three quarters of a million dollars, all commercial products, according to the wording in this new OGL 1.1, all commercial products will require their creators to report their work to Wizards of the Coast. All commercial products. And if they that's don't every like it, stream, they can kill that's, it. Yeah, like, that's every stream. That's every Kickstarter. That's every campaign module. That's that's everything. Mm-hmm. So even if you're not gonna, even if you're gonna make four dollars from DMs Guild, you have to you have to individually submit your products to Wizards of the Coast. That's a whole nother level of consternation and headache. I like, mean, go ahead. Does that mean for DJs and Dragons too? Like I wouldn't yep. even want to bother because we're not operating on a profit at all. So why exactly. would I? You're just so running a fun game, right? Example, but- this is a great example. DJs and Dragons is a Twitch show. 
Mm-hmm. By my understanding, and again, I let me let me start out by saying I have not read the OGL 1.1 in full. What I have read is the snippets that I think are relevant to me based on the lawyers that I follow on Twitter and that I'm friends with in my D and D groups that have like cut and pasted mm-hmm. the parts that are relevant to content creators such as you and me. Um, in the example of a show like DGens and Dragons, we are grandfathered in to the original OGL because uh, we started our show when that was in effect. When OGL 1.1 goes into effect, future seasons of DGens and Dragons would be subject to it, which means we would need to specifically – uh, not negotiate, but specifically report, um, essentially. report yeah. uh, the next season of DGens and Dragons to Wizards of the Coast. Right. What if it's not broken that, down into seasons? Uh, probably. We, if it's not broken down into seasons, then we could probably just keep making it. Um, well, let me tell you. I don't know. The, the, final, the final shoe to drop here, just so we can, we can get to move on here, uh, was that there was a message you had mentioned from an insider inside Wizards. Now, did we need, you know, to be told that the suits only care about money? I guess we did, but they do. And they said, look, you know, the Wizards doesn't care about anything but the dollar. And the decision is made, you know, entirely on the uh, uh, provable impact on the bottom line. Uh, they were definitely looking at D&D beyond subscriptions and cancellations, as it's the quickest financial data that they have. And I, yep. I got to tell you, I think that line in particular really set off the uh, you know the snowball who created yeah. the avalanche because shortly thereafter hashtag stop the sub showed up it is the yeah. third highest link in the D subreddit right now uh to cancel your DD beyond subscriptions it literally crashed the subscription portion of the DD beyond website for a while as you couldn't even yeah. go to cancel it because i believe you know you could argue that so many were it was causing a problem it's um, so weird that when people are mass unsu- unsub- unsubscribing from things that the links are always down and broken we had weird. a similar thing with stream elements late or stream labs remember we couldn't yeah. unsubscribe from them for a yeah. while too and cancel our memberships isn't that weird that's crazy so um i feel bad for the D beyond people um, because they, I, they don't want this. Like no, I mean, the, the people that want this are in Providence, Rhode Island and work for Hasbro and are like maybe four people in all of wizards of the coast headquarters. Maybe the people who actually are on the ground and just want to make cool stuff for people hate this yeah. because there's lots of people in wizards want, who can't say they anything. don't want this. Right. Yeah. There's lots of people in wizards that can't say anything. Here. And I, I feel bad for the D and D Beyond people. I feel bad for the D and D people. I feel bad for the just the generic wizards. You know, knows the grindstone. All I want to do is make games, people. Like it's rough. Now the news out at this point is that Wizards of the Coast cancels the OGL announcement after online ire. That's kind of where we're at. They were supposed to have a stream today that was going to say something while well, that thing got canceled after everyone spammed open D and D hashtags all over the place. And, yeah. um, it's a hot mess. It is, uh, it's a hot mess. And if there were anyone in the building, uh, who told them this was an unbelievably bad idea, congratulations, you were right. And, uh, I am curious to see where it goes. If anything, yeah. I'm actually kind of excited about the open source thing. I think that's great. Sure. Just, I mean, like, and we, that's for Pathfinder. That's for what's well, going to be for everybody. Like, well, it would be an open gaming license right. that you could make Pathfinder games. You could make other third party mm-hmm. systems with. Um, it, it would it would be a place for all of that to live together. Right. Um, Wizards of the Coast managed to do something that no other gaming company could do which is get people to check out other tabletop role-playing games. Oh, it is incredible. And of course, in that magical letter that Paizo wrote, they didn't know, oh, hey, and here's a discount code. If you want to get started in Pathfinder and Starfinder and check out these other publishers who are involved, um, just, a, just a monumental failure. When you thought 30th anniversary was as low as it was going to go. Okay. Let's talk about some leaks, shall we? We don't talk about spoilers on this show officially. However, this is the argument I brought up in the pre-show. If you bought a pack of magic cards, 
and in it is one of these rares. You did nothing wrong. You stole yeah. nothing from warehouses or dumpsters or whatever. You just bought a pack of cards and it's in there. Is it really a leak? Like at that point, is it yeah. just a just a mistake? Like I, I I agree with your take on that. I think that it, it, to the strict letter of the law, if we talked about the cards that were uh, shown early from Phyrexia All Will Be One because mm-hmm. they were in Dominary Remastered packs, I don't think we would be doing anything wrong. But but in the, the spirit, spirit of, of spoiler yeah. season, we'll we'll see how Wizards wants to handle it. They have until Tuesday before their spoilers start. Um, Nurgle, how you feel about that? I don't care too much about spoiler season in general and about leaks. I don't care to look at them or discuss them normally just because like especially now we're in a constant state of spoilers. Like I'm not ex- excited for the spoilers when they come out naturally. If they come out a week earlier, I'm not any more excited. Like there's always new cards. I will never see them all. So whatever. Yeah. Um, I will say for people to consider them a leak and say, like if you're posting them or, or things like that um, is, is not uh, fair. I think to get mad at people who, like you said, just bought product, you, you actually bought them. Um, and also like, Wizards does weird things like this sometimes where they post like they, they they give you like in the secret layer, they put the text backwards and upside down visa seer or something Visor-seer. and then proceeded to never tell anybody if it was like a misprint or anything like that. So like, I don't think wizards do this on purpose, no, but it's in so. official wizards product. So yeah. I'm not going to count that against the people. Um, I will be interested to see if anything comes of it like someone did it on purpose and purposely swapped a sheet and leaked it that way on purpose. Hmm. I don't think that would be the case only because there's no clout to be had with that. But like maybe Tybalt's just working in the factory and it's just like, (laughs) I'll show these people who didn't give me a bonus this year. Right. Just an actual agent of chaos. Got it. That's funny. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's wild. And, um, for what it's worth, I think the cards look sweet. I'm excited to play with them. Um, I did not see them. Well, you will eventually as they come out of those draft packs. Um, but today was the world building stream where they talked about some of the story, uh, from the set, uh, heuristic studies had an amazing little, uh, vignette there in the middle of it, talking about, you know, sort of the flavor of Phyrexia and how it works. Now it's a sort of a viral society and whatnot. And from all intents and purposes, from what I can gather, like this is the empire strikes back the set. This is sure. the, the bad guys are winning. Like yeah. the bad, you get to play, you know, the bad guys, you get to play with the bad guy cards, you get to do the bad guy things. And, it's kind of cool. Like, you know what I mean? We've been on the side of the resistance and from Aether Revolt or whatever to, you know, the, the resistance and War of the Spark. I mean, we've been a lot of the resistance, but you don't always get to kind of just dive in and just, you know, be evil. Yeah. It's the first time. I mean, even during War of the Spark, you kind of never really felt hopeless. Right. In my opinion, like there was there was a time in a in a full set, let me say, because sure. the war of the spark was the fight. Right. So the fight, you knew that the fight would end up with the good guys winning at the end. Right. And then just before war of the spark, there wasn't a, the full battle happening. It was still the machinations leading up to it. Right. This is the first time that we've really had a Avengers um infinity war style ending right where we go wait a second we're, we're losing and i have to wait another year and a half before we are winning again um and and that's exciting and i like that i like it when bad guys feel like they can win that's why new phyrexia felt so good the first time it came out why eldritch moon felt good um you know like when the bad guys are winning people love villains and especially, you know, it, it's it's cool to watch villains winning it, when it's not in real life. And of course. Uh, it's because villains are inherently more uh, engaging. Um, they're, they're just more interesting to play around with. And so while I look forward to the day when the good guys come out on top, because that's how that's how stories work. Uh, for now, I'm excited. I'm excited that we have this really down, dour, all hope is lost kind of situation. Huh. 
I am not that into the story side of things. So I like the tidbits that I hear. I like when we talk about them on magic mics or, um, you know, the stuff that gets posted on social media. I like the, the set videos that they come out with the trailers. I think mm. those are really cool, but going deep that deep into it, I don't do. So I don't get those sorts of feelings when I'm playing a new magic set, right? Like it doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't bother me or get me really excited. Um, I'm, I'm more about the theme and the feel of the set personally. So I, I just, I do appreciate and just sort of wanted to note that, you know, we don't always get the fact, you know, where the bad guys are winning, like just straight yeah. up. You're like, Holy cow, they, they did take over and they did win. And the, some of my favorite planeswalkers are now freaking Phyrexians. Like, what right. is going on? Right. That's and cool. The mechanics are reflecting that. I mean, we're going to have more planeswalkers with the completed keyword than ever before. Mm -hmm. We have this, we have toxic, which is a really cool keyword, mm -hmm. which means we get infect back in standard, kind of fixed. But yeah. we get, we have poison counters back in standard, I'll say. Yes. Um, and you know, it, it, we've got some really interesting things on the horizon, and I'm excited to see the story unfold. Um, does, does everybody yeah. remember who they picked for being completed? I, I had Nissa. Do you guys remember? I believe I picked Vraska. No, I picked Jace. Okay. Because you picked Vraska. Okay. I, don't, I, don't I just, really I just wanted a re quick reminder because it's going to, you know, a couple more episodes and we'll we'll be there. We'll so be there. we're going to hopefully yeah. find out if any of us was right. I think we put it in the chat somewhere. I want to say maybe I put mine in there. Um, yeah. Either way, we'll see because apparently some crazy stuff's going down and we'll see where it goes. Um, that said, they announced Magic Con Barcelona. Hey, hey. Yeah. hey. international bar, international uh, Magic Con. That's great. I'm excited. I actually would love to go to that. I went to Barcelona for the Pro Tour and I mm. loved it. It was delicious and fun. And if I got a chance to go, I totally would love that. Spain's neat. Yeah, I had a really good time in Spain. Yeah, if it's not uh, flooded. It's as long as it's not flooding, yes. That was that was the Valencia problem, but yeah. that was many, many years ago. Um, it's in but, June, <clears throat> by the way. Someone in chat's asking. Oh, uh, July 28th through 30th, what I have here. Oh, yeah, 28th I heard to June. 30th? Mm -hmm. July 28th through 30th. Okay. Um, okay. And obviously, you know, that's going to be great. I'm really excited to see what happens over in Europe. Again, this is a giant event where we'll, you know, see what the turnout is when uh, they have their own opportunity. And I uh, wish that the best. Um, a funny little stat showed up for uh, those who look at and play Legacy. Um, I think it's uh, Anurag, Anur Anurag Doss. I don't want to screw up that name. On on ZD. Anurag. Anurag. Is that right? I think it was um, Anurag. Anurag da, is it Das? 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 I don't yeah, know. Das. Das. Uh, Anzi DMDG. They said from the from the one from the January eighth challenge, the most played cards in Legacy was for was Lotus Petal, followed mm -hmm. by Force of Will, followed by Seasoned Dungeoneer. Yep, that's the one. Any, any, what the hell is the I Seasoned, know what seasoned Dungeon? Dungeoneer? Does well, I guess you do now. Well, now you should. Seasoned Dungeoneer is a card that says when it enters the battlefield, you gain the initiative. That's really all you need to know about it. But it's the th it's the rare one. It's so the four mana. It's the four, four mana three four. You get the when it enters the battlefield, you get the initiative, and then whenever you attack with a rogue cleric warrior or wizard, do something. Like who cares? Gains protection um, from creatures. Great. Right, but basically the the, the white the white initiative deck has been running rampant on legacy for a long time now. So you, you want to be going like uh Lotus Petal, Ancient Tomb, Fast Mana, uh play your season seasoned dungeoneer on turn two with a cavern of souls oftentimes um to make it uncounterable. And sort of I, I there was also some discussion amongst the legacy community about how they felt that Lotus Petal and other cards like Mox Diamond are probably underplayed in the format given how uh, recouping card advantage has become easier. Mm -hmm. Things like Minskin, like powering out a Minskin Boo, powering out a Season Dungeoneer, mm -hmm. um, these kind of effects, you can recoup that card advantage relatively easily. So people should be playing more Lotus Petal like effects. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is to say, Legacy is weird, man. Legacy is a weird format right now. Well, when you attack with the creature, you get to give it self protection from creatures, which means you get to get the initiative back, even if right. they took it from you. 
And it also explores for no good reason other than just advantage. Why not have an right. advantage? It's a dungeoneer. It explores. Oh, my Jesus. Um, so, yeah, it's kind it's of wild. Uh, I, I just have a feeling Wizards never, ever intended this to happen. No. But uh, as we move on to our uh, desperate ravings, you can check out our alter sleeve. Support the show. Be using the code Magic Mics to check out for 5% off anything in that store, including a set of exclusive sleeves featuring the Magic Mics crew at altersleeves.com. Slash magic mics. Let's get to some freaking desperate ravings. Um, I think we did. We talk about this a little bit last week, um, where there was a lot of doom and gloom, a lot of doomy and gloomy about about like, about singles prices are are collapsing. Oh, and, we did talk about that last yeah, week. Yeah, and there was there was another thread that came up that talked about how uh, people complain about you know the reprints or whatever, but also a lot of constructed viable magic cards are way cheaper. Than they used to be. I mean, Felwar Stone is now a buck and not six. Wayfarer's Bobble, Bobble is a buck and not four. You know what I mean? And this like, is good, right? Th- this seems amazing, right? Am I wrong? This this feels like they presented it in a way that was almost negative, and I think it's literally the opposite. You can get a Mana Drain for forty bucks. Like that's great. That's it's not one hundred and fifty. Like yeah, isn't that? I mean, it depends who's writing the article, right? Like someone with a mountain of mana drains is pretty unhappy about this. And if you have a pretty big collection slash your retirement in Magic product, and the prices are now a third of what they were a year and a half ago, Mm -hmm. it seems real scary. I'm I personally would like to play more Magic cards, but um, I mean, it does not surprise me that there's a thing here saying that like, oh no, the you know the sky is falling. Because for some people, it might maybe is. Maybe. Um, you know, yeah. and, I, and definitely those who have big collections can be affected. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this goes back to the old, if the cards aren't on the reserved list, you have no promise of anything. Um, they're all going to get reprinted. Wizards wants to reprint their cards. People, Wizards wants you to play their game. They're right. going to reprint the cards. So, and I think that's great for me. I think the best scenario is to have a very cheap version of almost any card, like, you know, and whatever cheap is, is defined by whatever defined it, but whatever, a cheap version, quote unquote, and then have some really cool deluxe versions, right? The secret layers and the promo foilies and the event based, whatever's high yeah. five, do that all day. Make my Snapcasters 20 bucks, have a $150 version. Great, but make my Snapcaster affordable. Uh, and the have, reason the reason it's one hundred and twenty something dollars though isn't is because there isn't that many. Like right. there's a huge if, if every person who wants to play with the cards and doesn't care about the collection aspect of it can mm-hmm. buy the cheap version, right. then the expensive version will tank. It won't be one hundred and fifty dollars anymore. Right. There's a difference between two hundred dollar base the mind sculptors. And two hundred dollar imperial recruiters, right? Yeah. There's a difference between uh, a card whose price is artificially high because of scarcity, rather than a card whose price is high partially because of rarity, but also partially because of how popular and good it is. Like fetch lands are going to keep being worth something, and they're going to print them every five years. Uh, shock lands are this exact same way, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're going to maintain their value because you need four of them for a lot of decks and a lot of formats, but something like, um, like we saw this, I think with like Rishadon port, even though that that was a card that is a four of in a highly played deck in a format, it didn't stay explosively high, mm-hmm. much less something like mana drain or Imperial recruiter where you really only need one. Yeah, so or some people need four, but like, uh, and I think honestly, I think Pokemon has this figured out fairly well. You know, there are very expensive trainer cards that you can get for like a buck, you know, but there's a really mm-hmm. expensive, fully hard to get version that showed up in some random set, you know, and it's like soul rings, right? You can get any random old soul ring or you can get the really nice ones that are pretty right. expensive. So they did perfectly with soul ring. They've done really well with uh, Mana Vault mm-hmm. also. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's also sort of perceived stuff, right? Because at one point, Nexus of Fate had more copies out in the world than any other Mythic Rare in the set, but was the most expensive by far because people felt it was expensive and hard to get and so on and so forth. Um, Gen Con is dropping their COVID precautions, and I don't know how I feel about it, but I don't feel like I feel good about it. They're, no proof of vaccination. They're dropping their their requirements. They don't require vaccination. No requirement for vaccination or a requirement to wear a mask. And 
I mean, the um, mask thing we've kind of mask thing I can seen. understand a little bit, but at the same time, is vaccination that bad to confirm? I uh, mean, they should definitely that that feels bad. I know, I know, we're all trying to move on, right? I know, I get it, I do, but I also know that you know we also live in a in a society um, that that bad things can be happening. I'm surprised that they've happen. dropped the COVID vaccination requirement. I'm not surprised that they dropped the mask mandate. And that's fair. Um, and another thing that I don't want to drag uh, Miss Nurgle into, but I do want to know because I do think it affects a lot of creators. <laughs> Ultra Pro, what's going on? What's up with Ultra Pro right now? I think Ultra Pro lost. is not do uh, the people, as I understand, the people who were at Ultra Pro who were doing creator management uh, may not be there any longer. And if there was someone who brought in to help them or replace them, they're not there any longer. And it's caused a lot of creators to be in a weird situation. And all I'm saying, just throw it out in the world, is Ultra Pro, please get your stuff together. Because people generally like supporting Ultra Pro for the last yeah. couple of years for a whole variety of you know goodwill reasons. Um, and that may be changing. Yeah, so, Ultra Pro is a company that's been around since the 1950s. Um, this is not some... Fly by mom and pop shop with no with no history and no like that you question so the fact that they're having a little bit of a moment is surprising mm. um i worked with ultra pro for 10 months last year uh i had a great time with my contract and i hope that they can figure themselves out they've been a great sponsor to uh my team for a full calendar year mm. um and i think that yeah they're just sort of in a in a, a sticky situation in that they don't have the things in place that they need to support content creators. So, you know, uh, most comp, you know, even if they just never come back, um, then, you know, it was good. They treated us well while we were there. It was fun um, while it lasted. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think that like everything they do is like contract work basically. So like, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's really um, main source of income is that. Mm -hmm. And, but it was a nice bonus, right? And there was promotions. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, I I would have obviously no problem at all if they want to stop doing whatever. Um, but, you know, if creators are being un are left unpaid, we should make those people whole, et cetera. Excuse yeah, me. Of course. So let's move on here to uh, some splash damage. Ruben, tell us about what, what happened to the World Series of Online Poker. Hey, everybody. Uh, turns out Magic players are good at other card games. And there's another card game called Texas Hold'em, which is a varietal of poker. Uh, both Nerd Girl and I uh, have spent a lot of time playing uh, Texas Hold'em uh, mm. over our careers. Lots of Magic players have, and lots of Magic players have won World Series of Poker bracelets. Uh, some names you might recognize, such as Brock Parker, Eric Frolick, David Williams. Um Gabriel Nassif. Um, and there's a new name to add to the list. As announced this week, my former roommate uh, and friend AJ Soccer is the 2023 Wizard World Series of Poker Online Player of the Year. Uh, he amassed the most points on the World Series of Poker.com website uh, of all runners over the past calendar year and won himself a, a, a nice chunk of change uh, and a nice World Series of Poker ring. I think it counts as a circuit ring. Um, nice. For those of you that know what uh, a circuit ring is, um, What's a that's circuit a big ring? win. So a circuit, so a World Series of Poker circuit event is not the same as a bracelet event. Bracelet event happens at that big festival over the summer in Vegas. Mm -hmm. When you win one of the big tournaments, you get a bracelet. The World Series of Poker circuit goes around the country in the off times and around the world in the off times. And if you win one of those events, you win a ring. Um, lots of World Series of Poker bracelet winners are also World Series of Poker ring winners. Circuit mm -hmm. rings are another mark of success, and uh, I believe that this counts as a circuit ring. Uh, and even if it doesn't, he gets a ring. I know he gets a ring for his. You get a ring, damn it! Victory. You get a ring. You're important. So well, yeah, very cool. That's, and of course, that's a nice. Yeah. I think I saw the tweet. Yeah. 
Yeah, and AJ Sager was a guy who made uh, magic content for a very long time. Hell, I knew him and hung out with him for uh, for many years, and it's great to have not heard from him in a very long time. But when you did and you do, you're like, oh, this is an awesome, positive thing yeah. that happened in his life. Let's go. That's great. Yeah. When this show started, I was living with AJ. So to tell you, that's how close I was with AJ. So nice. there you go. All right. Well, uh, that said. Let's turn the corner here to the finisher. Now, Wizards certainly has had better weeks. So tell me, what's the next cataclysmic shoe to drop for everyone's favorite subdivision of Hasbro, Ruben? Well, fortunately for WotC, they aren't the biggest dumpster fire in the fantasy genre these days yet. So I'm excited for their next big project, Universes Beyond Harry Potter. <laughs> Nerd girl. All right. Well, fortunately for me, my personal preview was not accidentally leaked. But to be fair, it's a Phyrexian set. So uh, the set should be full of oil leaks. So I'm excited for next week's preview, the legendary vehicle named Exxon Valdez. Ooh, ooh, rough, rough. Well, if anyone should be upset about all this, it should be the D&D movie people. So I recommend they use what they have and get the controversy veteran Hugh Grant to do some good old fashioned PR damage control. Let's get yeah. in there and explain yourself. He's he's rehabbed his image pretty good. He's done all right. He could give a few pointers, I think. And that ends the live episode of Magic Mike's. Thanks for joining us here to discuss all things magic and beyond. Thank you, Nerd Girl. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you, Ruben. D and D Beyond. D and D Beyond. And see, we move see on. what you did. You see what I did there? And we're going to move on here to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffing.com, our co-sponsor, Alter Sleeves, my co-host, MTG Nerd Girl, and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening, I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Please follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online on our, disc on our Discord, Twitch.tv, at Magic Mics, on Twitter, at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Or join us here next week. Same time, same place for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.